It's my joy again to bring part two of the theme and the vision of this year. So without further ado, uh, let's say a word of prayer and we begin. Okay, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us all back here. Lord, we thank you for your provision, your word, your spirit that dwells in each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you that you're working and you're calling and you're putting your divine words, your divine calling uh, into our hearts right now. That as we go on this journey, Lord, this year we will see how your word becomes flesh in and through us. Lord, bless, bless us, bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the question from last week uh, that we ended off with uh, is this question, what do I know that I need to be? What do I know that I need to be? And this is from our theme from knowing to being this year, right? From knowing to being. Now, it may sound a bit uh, conceptual, but I just want us to uh, bring it back to basics and to remind us that this is actually uh, rather simple. It's simply what has God called you and what has God what does God want to make you into, turn you into? What is the word He has put in you that He wants to become flesh through you? All right, so He wants to be a reality in all of our lives. We agree, right? He wants to be a reality in all of our lives. Now, the only thing stopping the Holy Spirit from working that, from working in and through us, is us. It's us. The only thing stopping him is us. But the good news is that he has given us everything that we need to become like him. Even though we are, we are no barrier, he has still given us everything that we need to become like him, to that which he has called us to be. So this year, in line with the theme of from knowing to being, the question is, what is this one thing? We start off with this one thing that we know that He wants us to be. And we cooperate with the Holy Spirit to see, okay, by the end of this year, maybe in the middle of the year, how are we more like Him? Right? How are we more like Him? So the question is, what do, uh, what do we know that we need to be? Or, we could also phrase it this way, what is His Word? What is His Word spoken to you that needs to become flesh? Just like how Jesus was the Word who became flesh, the spoken word into the universe and He became flesh to dwell in this earth, to walk in this earth. What is that one word He has spoken to us that needs to become flesh in our lives? Right? Second Peter uh, 1, 3 to 4, we covered this last week, that says, His divine power has given us everything that we need through knowledge, experiential knowledge of Him. Right? He has given us everything we need through knowledge that we might become we might change, we might be turned into, become partakers of this divine nature. So He has provided every single thing for us already. So this week, we want to expound uh, this theme of from knowing to being into three sub-themes uh, that will take us through throughout the entire year. And we believe that if we go through this theme, it gives us uh, a better chance uh, communally as a community to hear what He wants to say to us, to become that which He wants us to be. Okay, so I'll, I'll very quickly uh, run through the three themes before diving deeper into each of them. So the three themes uh, of this year is the proposal of Jesus, the priorities of Jesus, and the people of Jesus. The proposal of Jesus, the priorities of Jesus, and the people of Jesus. Uh, we don't have to go into this slide yet, we're going to it later on. Right, so just very quickly, uh, what are these three themes about? So in the phase of the proposal of Jesus, now proposal as in a marriage proposal, not he drafts out a document for us to sign, not that kind of proposal, but the proposal where he chases, he woos after us, he pursues us like how a groom pursues his bride. Right, the proposal of Jesus uh, is meant to reveal to us the love that he has for us. Right? The love that He has for us and how much He loves us uh, so that we can respond in kind. So that out from that position, we can love Him back, we can do what He has called us to do. Do you know duty? 
uh, duty only takes us so far. So for example, if you're a disciple and, and or you're a student of someone, it, says, it is your duty to fulfill these obligations. Duty will only take us to meet the mark, to fulfill what are the requirements. Lovers are the ones who go beyond the extra mile. And so when we start off this year, we want to see how he pursues us, how he, in a sense, proposes to us in this whole proposal phase, how he chases after us, because we want to fall in love with him. Right? We want to come to a point where we receive and, and know how much he loves us, that the only option that we have is to, is to just fall into his arms, much like the Shulamite woman in Songs of Songs. Right? Now, the second theme is uh, the priorities of Jesus. Right? It's to show us how we can, in a sense, be like Him. It isn't just to copy what are His priorities. It isn't just to know uh, what are the things that, uh, how He did the things He did or what did He do here on earth, but to know why He did what He did. Right? So it's the why and not the how to do or the what to do in this phase of the priorities of Jesus. So actually, what was he, how did he face life here? How did he go about life? By what value did he hold that he approached all different things? The priority, what is his priority here on earth? And I think immediately all of us already have the answer. He come to evangelize, he come to preach about the kingdom, he come to save the lost, many of these things, right? But what was his priority? So we will go through that. Uh, we will go through that uh, in, in, in this phase. And lastly, is the people of Jesus. Now, this phase grows us as a community. When we go through this sub-theme, we want to learn what it looks like, what it feels like to see how a people of God um, is like, or how the people of God are like. Right? We want to see how, uh, the pos- what are the possibilities of a Spirit-filled community a people that, uh, a body of Christ that is able to embrace the world when they come into this house. So like what Chichon was sharing uh, today in the papers about Citibank and about Lazada, last week we said, right, that uh, he will shake the world. He will shake the world and the treasures of the nations will come into the house. So I think he's shaking. He's shaking, Right? And so when the treasures of the nation, when the people of the nations comes and walks through those doors, they press basement too and they come down <laughs> and they walk through and they see the signboard. After they see the signboard, they turn left into this place here. How, what, what kind of people will they meet? Right? So in that phase, we'll find out. Okay? So let's get started. I want to go through the proposal, the priorities, and the people of Jesus a bit more in depth. And we'll use John 17 as our main guide through, the, through these three themes. So the first one is the proposal of Jesus. I apologize, it's a bit small. But when it's on YouTube, after it's uploaded, you can see. Lah. <laughs> okay, the proposal of Jesus. Now in this phase, there's something we need to know and something we want to be. One thing we want to know, one thing we want to be. So what do we want to know? We want to have a clear understanding of God's love shown towards us. A clear understanding. So we want to know that first. And hopefully by the end of it, we want to be fully convinced and convicted of His love towards us. Right? Fully convinced and fully convicted of His love shown towards us. What do I mean by this? We all know that God loves us. But how does it feel like to be walking in that uh, complete revelation, being convicted that He loves us? That means when someone falls sick, when we hear of uh, another Christian who says, uh, who suddenly is struck down with, with a severe sickness, oftentimes the thought goes through that person's mind. Is God punishing me? Is it because I have sinned too much? And because of that, He's withholding His love for me and that's why I'm feeling this. Right? And then that person will start to question and doubt. Maybe when things in life don't go according to their way, and they start to wonder, maybe God, I know God is real, but maybe He's not that good towards me. Maybe He doesn't love me as much as the other person who got His healing breakthrough. <laughs> right? So, we know His love shown towards us. 
But a person who goes through and, and is fully convinced and convicted of his love, all of those thoughts will cease to exist. They are able to understand, hold the tension within them that, okay, I'm going through such things, I'm going through difficult things in life, but it does not shake the foundation that He still loves me, that I'm His beloved child, that I'm well loved by the Father. In John 17, He, he, he helps us to see, uh, Jesus helps us to see the Father's love shown to us. us. He says this, uh, this part in his prayer. John 17 is the last prayer that he had uh, bef- in the Last Supper before he, he goes and gets betrayed and arrested and crucified. So this is his prayer for his disciples. He says this in John 17, 6, I have manifested your name. Just these five words, I have manifested your name. I'm draws attention to these five words. Now, two things that stands out. The first one is manifest. What does manifest mean? Right? In the Greek, it says... Uh, hmm. I need to pronounce the Greek word. <laughs> so I'm like stumbling a bit. Fenaru. Fenaru. It's 5319 in Strong's Concordance. Okay? You have to go and see. But essentially, you know the word phosphorus? Phosphorus, the metal phosphorus, when you burn it, it becomes very, very bright. It comes from that Greek, Greek word, phos, right? Phos. So when he says, I've manifested your name, he's saying, I have illuminated, I've made visible, I have, sh- I have properly illuminated your name. When Jesus says, I have manifested your name, he makes the Father in plain view to his people. Now, what does name mean? It doesn't just mean uh, the name of God. Name here in, in, in the Greek, it talks about, it refers to a person's character, a person's fame, a person's reputation, much like the, the neck of the woman, right? When you describe the neck of the woman, like, tau like David. <laughs> tau like David, right? The neck uh, is like, whether it refers to the character, you stiff neck generation. So when, when Jesus says, I've manifested your name, He's not just revealing the name, but the character, the reputation, how God the Father is really like. His personhood. And Jesus, when He prays, uh, I have manifested your name, in a sense, He's saying that I've made known and made obvious, I've come to reveal the Father towards all of us. Now, what did Jesus come to reveal about God? Now, the patriarchs who know God as the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. To to the patriarchs, God was a generational God. He is the high and mighty God. He's a God of the universe. He comes in, in, in a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. He opens up the Red Seas. He opens up the earth and He swallows people in. When Jesus comes to reveal the Father, How does He reveal Him? He reveals Him as Abba. Abba. A genuine, intimate, relational God. A God that comes, a a, a Father that comes to, to bring His children back. A Father that comes to love on His children. A Father that comes to grow His children when Jesus says, I have manifested your name, it's not just Yahweh He manifests. He reveals the nature, the love of God that He has towards us. Jesus came to reveal God as a personal Father, a loving Father. Jesus also comes to reveal that God loves us. Right? A loving Father that that loves us. And what did He do that most plainly demonstrates this? A love that stops at nothing. What did He do? He came in the form of a man to go on the cross to reconcile us back to Him. In a sense, He says, I love you and I'm stopping at nothing to get you. That's the love of our Father. The love of the Father that Jesus comes to to reveal to us. See, Jesus reveals this in the course of His entire life. So much so that when Peter 
was a recipient of His love after He has betrayed Him, after He has denied Him, when He sees Jesus on the shoreline and recognises Jesus in the state of His, uh, I don't know what He's feeling, guilt, remorse, He runs towards Jesus instead of hiding away from Him. So in this phase, we want to know more about how much the Father loves us. We read and we study Jesus to know Him. To know Him is to read and study Jesus. Jesus is the only one who has the perfect revelation of God the Father. Not Adam, not Abraham, not Jacob, not Isaac, not the prophets, not Job. None of them have a perfect revelation of, Jesus, of who God is because they were not with Him. And so all the experiences of Him is only that, that, that portion, that facet of who God is. Jesus comes and He reveals completely the Father to us. So if we want to read the, uh, the Old Testament, we actually have to read at it through the lens of Jesus. Then we get to see who the Father is. So we want to read, we want to study, we want to know more about the Father's love shown through us through Jesus what he did here, how he behaved, how he conducted himself, how he treated certain people. You see, the law says that if a woman is caught in adultery, the people have to stone her. Jesus comes and he forgives her and he says, go and sin no more. He reveals an aspect of the Father's heart that was missing. We look through that, that lens of Jesus and we say, okay, this is how the Father loves me. This is how the Father loves me. So we want to read, we want to know uh, of His love. But a follow-up question that I had is, okay, then how can I be convicted and convinced of His love? How? How do I be convicted and convinced? Well, in John 15, 9, Jesus gives a clue. It's, it's still in the Last Supper, but it's a bit before that. Right? He says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Abide in my love. Abide in my love. It's one thing to know of how much He loves us. We know that through reading the Bible. Now, we need to stay in love as well. To be in that position of love. To let His love continually remind us, wash us, cleanse us of our old ways. To renew our mind. It takes time for us to... to to be convicted of His love, that there will come a day that we will say, okay, I don't know what's happening, but I know one thing is for sure, He loves me. Now, how does this show up in our lives? Someone who, who knows that they're loved, and, but they, don't, they are not convicted, how does this look like? Well, I've often heard stories of, uh, of kids who are adopted into families. All right? especially young kids and they, they grew up in maybe broken homes, abusive homes, uh, where their parents don't treat them very well and along comes a, a genuine loving uh, couple and, and, and they adopt the kid. And, and I've heard stories, right, that at dinner table, they're eating and then the kid will like, try to keep food. <laughs> they try to keep food, hide biscuits at the dinner table. And... Only later on, when, when, the, when, when like the mom of the dad goes, why are you keeping food? <laughs> why do you, why you need to hide food for yourself? And we come to realise that because of the uh, environment that the person grew up in, the kid grew up in, maybe the, the kid grew up in uh, a place where there was no food, they had to fight for food. That, that behaviour, that, that belief in them that I have to fight for myself, I have to take care of myself, I have to provide for myself, carries on into the next family that he comes into. So the kid is adopted and he knows he's loved. He knows that, okay, this group of people, this, this couple loves me, cherishes me, but he hasn't feel that yet. He doesn't fully believe that yet. See, an adopted orphan's behaviour stems from the lack of knowledge, of experience of how much he is loved. So too we are born in a world of sin. Our mind is darkened, our experience darkened uh, by sin so that we don't know of him, we don't know of his love. Our, our, our minds were, were, were darkened to the Father's, 
to the Father's love. And so as we come to know Him, as we read about Him, we rediscover about how much He loves us, we need to position ourselves to abide in His love, to remain in His love, right? to stay there, to let Him and let the Holy Spirit condition us, say, I'm with you, I'm taking care of you, don't worry, I love you, I love you, I love you. Be, we come to a place where we are aware of it, we are convicted by it, and we experience it so that there is beyond a shadow of a doubt that He loves us. And the freedom that enables us to walk out. To walk out. Right? So one question I have for us, and you could write this down, maybe it's something to think about, to share about in your in life group, but what does it look like to be fully convinced of His love? What does it look like to be fully convinced of His love? So after knowing of His love, we come to the priorities of Jesus. Right? The priorities of Jesus. There's one thing we want to know and one thing we want to be when it comes to the priorities of Jesus. The first thing is to know how did Jesus live out His life? How did He live out His life? Right? And to be one that approaches life and decisions in the manner Jesus did. So why about why priorities of Jesus is because, well, if He's here and He knows He has the fate of the world in His hands, He has like, salvation of the entire world, past, present, future, held in his hands. And he knows he only has three years to do it. What would he do? <laughs> what would he do? <laughs> right? It's strange that we don't find him running about. Oh, wake up, okay, I must do this, I must do this. Oh, wake up, okay, I need to plan out my day and schedule it minute by minute, minute, like wedding day like that. <laughs> right? It's planned to the minute. He knows he has three years to do, to... For, for his plan of salvation, to bring people back to the Father. Three years he has to do. The first like, 27 years of his life, the first 30 years of his life, I don't know what he's doing, like, just growing up, growing up, growing up, but three years his ministry time, what would he do? If all of us knew we had three years left to live and we we're going to see our Father again, what would we do? Right? We, we don't find him running about, we don't find him stressing, we don't find him uh, coming up with like gun charts, uh, vision boards. We don't find him coming with all of these things. So how did he live his life? What was his priority? Right? What was his priority? Now, he, I, think he, I think this was the emphasis. He knows he's going away already. And so he tells this to his disciples in John 17 verse 8. Right? He says this, For I have given them the words that you gave me. For I have given them the words you gave me. He knows he's going away. He has three years to disciple this bunch of 12 kids. And he's going away and he, and he says this. He tells the Father, for, the, for I have given them the words you have given me. We see a consistent theme in the life of Jesus. In the life of Jesus, in his ministry. This consistent theme that he does, right? And this is something that is quite familiar to us. We see this consistent theme of him going to the Father, of him hearing what the Father has to say and obeying what the Father has to say. All that the Father has given to him, he hears from the Father and he gives them to his disciples. Right? When it was time to heal, he healed. To evangelize, he evangelized. When it was not time to heal, he refrained. When it was time to go on the cross, he went on the cross. There are many things and important things to do in the life of Jesus, right? Many things to do. But what was his main priority? And I think his main priority here is to come back, to live by what he hears the Father say. Now, why is that so? Because why is it his priority to do that? because there's just too many things to do. <laughs> there is too many things to do. And if we try to do everything, it's overwhelming. 
right? It's overwhelming. And He knows that the Father in Heaven is omniscient. He knows the Father in Heaven knows what's best for that season, that generation, that three years. He knows what exactly, the Father knows what exactly needs to be done for there to be everlasting, eternal impact. And so Jesus goes to him, says, okay, Abba Father, tell me what I need to do. We can, we can put discipleship, evangelism, uh, preaching, uh, classes, we can put all of those things as the list of our priorities. But we cannot let that distract us, that those are the emphasis. We have to first go and ask him what's needed in this time. What would you like us to focus on in this season? And we hear from him and he gives us the grace, then we do. That will be fruit that lasts. That will be fruit that will last for eternity. That will be the reward at the end when all of our thing comes and he burns it, be gold and silver and not dross that is being burnt up. Now, sometimes also we make the mistake and we see Jesus' priority was uh, when he sees a multitude of, of sheep and he says, send them or send because the harvest is ripe. And, and we think that uh, we need to do what he did, exactly what he did, right? We, we oftentimes make the mistake of, okay, I just need to copy and paste what Jesus did. If that were true, right, all the optometrists, the Christian optometrists in Singapore, the eye doctors, will be busy spitting and blah, spitting and blah, spitting and blah, right? But no, so the, the point is to not just on the surface copy and paste but to, to go behind the heart, to go behind the why did he do what he did. And we find that, and we find that he always goes back to the Father to hear what does he want us to do. So that's the priority of Jesus, is to live by his voice. So in this verse, he says, for I have given them the words that you gave me. In context of this, right, Jesus was talking about his disciples, the words that he gave to his disciples. So what were the words he gave to his disciples? It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. <laughs> we know that the words he gave is found in the Bible. But if, but if this prayer is meant for us as well, what are the words that he gave us? Have you wondered? What are the words he's giving to us? And, and I think of it as, as two things, right? One, he has given us a written word. This written word works like our map here on earth. Now imagine we're going through life, right? And we have to navigate through this terrain called life. What are the words that he has given us? Number one, firstly, is the Bible. And the Bible, I think, is a map to tell us this is the path to take in life. But he gives us another, another thing to navigate through this life. And he gives us the Holy Spirit. And I think on top of the word, on top of the map that is guiding us through this, this path of life. He gives us the Holy Spirit as, well, He says as, as, as a helper. <laughs> Thank you. Right? As a paracletos, as the one who comes alongside us. He gives us the Holy Spirit to be our living guide through life. So let's say if you're going on, on a mountain track, if you want to track to Everest Base Camp, right? Uh, if you want to track to Everest Base Camp, and, and you go to the counter and say, okay, can I have a map, please? And okay, it gives you the map. And so you know the way to Everest Base Camp. You know the way there. But what if the person says, oh, come, I'll bring you along. I've been, I've been through that many times. Let me bring you along. As you're walking away, you're following the map. And then through this junction, the guide says, hey, no, no, no. Uh, I think it's better we go right. It's, it's a longer route, but it's safer. Because uh, the last week has been raining quite a bit. So on the map, this is the shorter way, but the roads are a bit more washed out. The, the river is a bit strong. So why not we go this way? And so what are the words that Jesus gives us? He gives us not just the written word, but the living word, the Holy Spirit who comes to guide us through life. I have given them the words that you gave me. is isn't just the Gospels. is isn't just the epistles. But he gives us the Holy Spirit for us to hear, for us to ask, for us to lean on, to guide us through this life. Now, what is the outcome 
What is the outcome of keeping the Father's commandments? What is the outcome of, outcome of obeying His voice? John 15 tells us as well. John 15 tells us, just now, uh, yeah, John 15 tells us, he says, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Oh yeah, okay, it's this. <laughs> He says, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. He also says in John 15, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. See, the outcome of Jesus, the outcome of Jesus keeping His Father's commandment was that He was staying in the Father's love. He stayed in the Father's love. How did Jesus walk in this life convinced, convicted that the, father's, that the Father loved him so much? He stayed in His commandments. He went out, He listened to His voice, and He obeyed. He stayed in His commandments. Now, I have to make it clear that it's not conditional, which means that if we think that if we don't obey His commandments, then we are outside of His love. Right? If we don't obey His commandments, then we sin and then we are not, He stops loving us. No, 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 no. His love is unconditional. He loves us whether or not we obey His commandments or not. That's why before we accepted Him, before in our sinful state, He sent His Son to die for us. His love is unconditional. What this is referring to, Jesus says, I have kept my Father's commandments and abided in His love. He's saying, if you keep the Father's commandments, if you are willing to stay in the posture, stay in obedience to what He has called us to be, you'll be in a posture of receiving His love for you. You'll be in a posture and, and you'll receive the benefits of His love, of being in His love. When He says, abide in my love, it's so that when he says, sorry, when he says to keep my commandments so that you can abide in his love, it's for us to know, okay, if I obey him, I get to be in this posture of, of receiving the love that he has that he's pouring out towards me. See, it's not easy to obey him. Oftentimes we think, okay, just here and obey lah. He tells me to uh, wear black color shirt, then I wear black color shirt. <laughs> Or he tells me to do this, then I do this. But sometimes it's difficult to obey him, right? Sometimes he may tell us to forgive when it hurts. Sometimes he may tell us to bless some, someone at the expense of our own uh, finances or at the expense of our own convenience. Sometimes he tells us, serve under this person. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it affects our pride, right? But when we obey him, the end result the end result is always, is always being able to fully receive that intimacy with Him, to experience that intimacy that He longs to have for us, that comes through obedience. Sometimes we need to, we struggle to, um, we struggle to, to maybe forgive someone and we go through that whole process of tossing and turning and at the end of the day, we say, God, I, I forgive, I let go. And then you hear the Father say, I'm so proud of you. I know it's not easy, but I'm so proud of you. The affirmation from Him, oh, the intimacy with Him, I think is what Jesus did. His entire life that allowed Him to abide in the Father's love. Just remember, before he chose the disciples, the Bible records he went up to pray. When he came down, he chose the disciples. When he went up to pray, I'm sure the discussion about Judas came up. <laughs> right? The Father is saying, choose Judas. You've got to choose him. And Jesus, no, no this is the one. <laughs> if anyone I don't want to choose, is this one. This is the one who will betray me. This is the one who will send me to my death. But as Jesus came down the mountain, Judas, follow me. And he, I don't know, maybe the next day he goes and pray, talks to the Father. He says, ah. 
He hears the father say, I'm so proud of you. It's going to be so tough. You already know what is going to happen. But I'm here with you every single step of the way. See, this is the result of, of obedience. When he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You will receive it. Your, your heart is open towards it. You know what's the natural byproduct of the disciples? Jesus says, right, uh, the first verse that we have, for I've given them the words you gave me, and immediately after that, he says this, they have received them, I mean, the disciples have received the word, they have taken hold of that word, and certainly know that I came from you. See, the result of the disciples taking hold of, the, of receiving the words that Jesus had given them, is that they are fully convinced He's the Son of God. Fully convinced He's the Son of God. Are there times that we kind of doubt He's the Son of God? Are there times we kind of doubt His, his divinity, that He is real? He says here, if we hear and obey, there is 100% doubt, no doubt. 100% no doubt that we know Jesus is the Son of God, sent from the Father here for us. And now today, dwelling in and, in and through us through the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when uh, I want to share, uh, I want to share like the gospel with, with some unbelieving friends, there's a part of me that's like, yeah, maybe it's not that real. Lah. <laughs> that's, why, that's why things happen, right? That's why things happen, maybe it's not that real. There's that little doubt in me because a part of me is still not that convinced yet. Not that convinced. But for someone who has obeyed his voice constantly, consistently, who has received the Father's love and affirmation and he knows without 100%, 100% he knows he is real. No problem telling his friends. No problem telling the people around him that he's real. They will stand up for Jesus. So I ask a question when it comes to the parodies of Jesus. What does it look like to approach life like Jesus did? What does it look like to approach life like Jesus did? To be fully convinced and convicted of His love and then living life, hearing the Father say and say, okay, I will follow because I know you love me. You have my back. Because I know you love me. I will follow whatever you want me to do. Now the third thing, the third uh, sub-theme of of the year is the people of Jesus. The people of Jesus, right? So we want to know how a community of believers look like and we want to be a community where both believers and non-believers encounter God through His family, right? We want to know, um, we want to be a community where both believers and non-believers encounter God through His family. In John 17, 21, towards the end of the prayer, he prays for us and he says this, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. Jesus repeatedly tells of this mutual indwelling of the Trinity. He says that they may be one just as you are in me and I in you. He, he refers back in, in his communication, in his preaching, he says, I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. He says, if you see me, you see the Father. Jesus describes the relationship that he has with the Father. And, and he's talking about this relationship he has and he says, the people of my people, my people will have this unity that is like this, will have this relationship that is like what I'm experiencing with the Father and myself and the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a Greek term used to describe this uh, mutual indwelling okay, of the Trinity. And this Greek word, I know how to pronounce this better, it's called perichoresis. Okay, perichoresis. Okay? Now, perichoresis uh, is, is a Greek word coined and, and is, is named, it's, um, it is coined to describe how the Trinity uh, relates, function, uh, dwells with one another. Okay. So, in a sense, it's all three persons occupying the same space at the same time 
In a sense, you cannot see God without seeing all three persons at the same time. It, it's like this, it's like the three of them are, are one, but yet three. They are never separated, but yet they never merge with one another. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit exist together with each other. And perichoresis is, uh, is seen when Jesus says, the Father, uh, just as you, the Father, are in me, and I am in you. And Jesus prays in John 21 that we may experience one another, like how the Trinity are in perichoresis. You see, individually, we are together with the, with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit resides in us. Right? But communally, how do we achieve that? How do we achieve this divine state of perichoresis, of mutual indwelling with one another? And, well, in Jesus' time, He says when we see Him, we see the Father. They both occupy the same space at the same time. Here on earth, we cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Right? But what's the closest thing that, that I thought of that can explain this in a community is, have you seen those salsa dancing shows? You know, those like when people go dancing and, and, and it's not just like one person, it's a whole group of them. Right? They are dancing together and as they dance together, they, they hand off uh, the girl to another guy and then the guy picks and somehow wow, they all start dancing with one another. Right? And I think the analogy that I can best think of is something like that. Right? That, that the partner can move so well with one another that there seems to be this, this flow. They seem like they are one. Not as a partner. But when the whole group is able to move and flow like that, it seems like, wow, this whole community is like one. They are flowing with each other. They are moving with one another. And it somehow seems like there is this unity among them. Maybe like how Jesus was like. The Father tells him and he moves. Right? The Father tells him and he moves and he moves and he moves together with them. But in our community, if I were to put this dance floor analogy to our community, well... I think we're all at different skill levels. <laughs> some people can dance. Some people have two left feet. Some people got like as if no feet like that. <laughs> and I think the skill level of, of the dancer represents the maturity of love that each one of us have. Right? So, in, in this dance floor, we're going to be handing people off to, to someone whose skill level is much lower, who is less mature. And when the more mature person picks them up, he's going to step on your feet. He, he tries to lead and you step on my feet. Lead, step on my feet. Right. And what to do? <laughs> you go and change, change, change your, your dance partner. <laughs> do we do that? <laughs> well, sometimes we do. <laughs> the easy way out, right? But when Jesus prays for this, a community that experienced His Holy Spirit, He was fully convinced and convicted of His love. A group that has the priorities of God, who knows that, who knows maybe uh, the night before, says, okay, in the coming months, I'm going to send you someone who you are supposed to disciple. That person comes, dances, and steps on your feet. What does the more mature person do? It's okay. It's okay. I teach you. I lead you. I guide you. Right? Let me teach you. And the person grows. Right? And the person grows. Now, in the community, there's also going to be some less mature, younger one who comes into the dance floor, watches one or two YouTube tutorials and thinks he knows everything already. <laughs> right? He comes in barging and says, no, let me lead you. Let me do. And then on the older person, what does the older person do? Yes. <laughs> right? No, the older person says, okay, let me guide you. So there has to be that for the younger one, uh, a humility to say, okay, I will follow, I will lead, uh, not I will lead, I will follow, I'll follow you, you lead me, you guide me. And sometimes the older person, seeing the younger person is growing, says, okay, you lead me, <laughs> I will follow you. 
someone less experienced, right? Say, so, okay, you are less experienced, but you lead me, I will follow you. And, and over time, this, this dance floor, this dance community will start to move in a way that is like perichoresis. Will start to move in a way that is seamless. Move in a way where love is shown, love is given, love is received, honour is given, respect is given, respect is, is received. In, in a way that when someone walks through the doors, walks through not just our church doors, but in our own life groups, they're like, there is a unity among these people that is something I've not seen before. Right? It's something that I have not seen before. And you know what? Maybe the time is coming. The time has come. And the time came. <laughs> that God shakes the world. And the people of the treasures of the nation, the people of the nation, look to the one place that says that they are family. And the, and the people of the world are looking towards that one place that says that they are the light of the world. And when they come nearer and they draw nearer, ah, what type of family would the nations, would the people of the nations experience when they meet us? Right? What type of family? So, the three things, the three sub-themes of this year and what we hope to achieve the proposal of Jesus, the priorities of Jesus, and the people of Jesus. When we come to the proposal of Jesus, we want to be fully convinced and convicted of His love towards us. So that that affects and that shapes our identity, our sonship with Him. It shapes the posture of, of, how, we, uh, the posture of how we live our Christian life. Then we come to the priorities of Jesus, to be one that approaches life and decisions in the way that He does. There, there needs to be a point where we do. But first, we need to be. We need to be loved by Him. We need to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. We need to be uh, children of a perfectly loving Father, to know He loves us, to know that He's not a God that delights in, in, in rendering judgment, to know a God that when He disciplines, is not because He's punishing us, because He loves us. No, no parent delights in caning their child. Wow, I'm so happy I get to cane you today. I meet my quota. No parent does that. <laughs> no. So imagine when God has to discipline us, like it says in Hebrew. It is tough for us. But I'm sure he has, it, 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 it's, it's tough for him. But he knows the end result. He loves us. So we need to know and be loved by him then we, we do. Because if we don't move to the doing stage and we forever just stay in the receiving stage, we may become, may become spoiled, entitled people. Just like the little princess who always, you know, the daddy always says yes to and grows up and thinking everyone says yes to her. Right? Or the son who always, uh, always be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, have you, do you know who is my father called? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Right. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, we don't know, right? But so there needs to come the doing, and in the doing, we mature. Through trial and error, we mature and we grow. We learn how to abide in His love through obeying His commandments, right? The priorities of Jesus to approach life like how He does. And finally, a people, the people of Jesus, a community where both believers and non-believers encounter God through His family. At that stage, we still have to practice practice being that group of people that He has called us to be. Right? So, we rewind and we come to today. And I just want to invite the band up, please. Uh, to the one question that we started off with. What do you know that we need to be? Right? Before all of this can function, all of this can, can take place, He's bringing us on a journey, right? And He longs to shape us, to mold us, to change us, to, to make tweaks in us so that we can be more and more like Him. 
more and more Christ-like, walking in the perfect sonship, the perfect revelation of the Father's love. Hearing what the Father has in store for us, the priorities of the Father in this season of our life. To be as a community, a group of people who like what he says, the light, the city on a hill, they cannot be hidden. To be one that experiences perichoresis. That when, when non-believers come in contact with us, they are drawn in by us drawn in by the love that He has for us. And it starts with this. What do you know that you want to be? What do we know that we want to be? And I think as a, as a exercise, as a something that we can do, in a sense, activation that we can do, uh, I would like us to all just take the, the little communion cups that we have. Now, if you don't have it, just uh, raise up your hand, wave it in the air, like you just don't care. Right? A everyone have? Hey? Oh. What's that? And let's stand. Let's stand. Okay. And let's prepare first. If not, everyone will know that you are <laughs> opening this thing. Okay. Okay. Now, Jesus used many different things to bring across lessons, to teach things the sheep, the birds of the air, and he used in this instance the cup and the blood, the bread and the blood, right? I want to repurpose what he, he used, okay? He said that this is my body, this is my body, right? And, and in John, we, we started off with my word became flesh. What is the word he has given to us that he wants to make flesh into our lives? And so this represents the word that becomes flesh, his body. This represents what is the word, Lord, that you have given to me, that when I partake of this, will become flesh in me. What is the word that you are giving to me, that when I uh, receive of this, will become flesh this year, in my life. Just like how the word became flesh, your word in my life will become flesh in me. What is it? Now, if we have it, then we hold it in our hearts and we hold it in our hands. If we don't have it yet, then say, Lord, send the word. Send the word. Send the word, Lord. Send the word. I'm here. I'm waiting. Send the word. Okay. So let's take a minute. Let's take a minute and ask God. If we don't have it, say, Lord, send the word. If we have it, say, Lord, this is your word given to me. Father, in our hands, we hold your word, your divine Rima word. Your word, Lord, that you want to turn into flesh in our lives this year. Lord, your word that you have given to us, you have breathed upon us, you have imparted in our spirits to us. Lord, we want to use this just as an act maybe a prophetic act to say, Lord, may your word become flesh in me. May I be consumed by your word. May I consume your word so that this year I can be molded and shaped into you. Lord, may I eat of your word so much that like John who no longer says, there is a voice in the wilderness, but John says, I am the voice in the wilderness. Lord, may this be the word that becomes flesh in our lives today. Jesus' name, let's eat of the word. Mm. 
Now this represents is, is the wine, but usually represents the Holy Spirit. So in our hands, we hold, or when we drink of it later, we want to say, Holy Spirit, I'm here. You fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, empower me, lead me. Help me, Holy Spirit, to submit to your, to your authority, submit to your rule, submit to your reign, submit to you moving in and through me. So this represents you know, the blood, the wine, the Holy Spirit, right? So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we hold you. And we ask Holy Spirit, fill us. Empower us. And right now, I know there are some areas that are coming up to us that the Holy Spirit is reminding us and just bringing it back up to us. Say, yeah, you're struggling with this. Maybe it's your flesh that is speaking to you. Say, you think you can do it? You cannot. If you have been struggling with this issue for so long, there is no hope and that's your flesh speaking. But as we drink, as we drink of the cup, we are saying, Holy Spirit, I lean on you. I choose to trust your leading more than what my flesh says, more than what the enemy says. Consume me, Holy Spirit. Consume me, Holy Spirit. So let's take a minute and just commune and let's talk with the Holy Spirit. Just bring ourselves to humble submission before Him. pray. Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Empower me. Empower me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Let's drink of the cup. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's come to God in worship. And as the, as the worship team just leads us, let's posture and position ourselves to continually receive from Him. Okay?